Hello, this is Dr. James Camp from Lee College in Baytown, Texas, and this is my presentation on the physiology of the lower brain. Um, we conventionally divide the brain into two halves. Uh, the lower part of the brain is the subconscious or unconscious parts of the brain, uh, often sometimes called the reptile brain or uh, the primitive brain because it goes uh, most of these parts go back as far as uh, any land living mammals uh, and and some of them even farther back than that um, but you know all mammals that breathe have the same uh, all, all reptiles that breathe all birds that breathe all have the same uh, brain stem structures that enable breathing. Okay, so we're going to go through um, a brief introduction to what these parts all do. We're going to start with the brain stem, which is really that, you know, reptilian brain, the part that um, handles completely unconscious uh, regulation of, of what goes on in our body. And then we'll move up to the diencephalon, which is also an unconscious part of our brain. Um, and in there, we'll also pick up the, uh, uh, the cerebellum as well. So the brain stem, uh, we're going to take a top down view of this. A lot of books uh, go from the bottom up and, and maybe I should have, but um, I was having a top-down moment when I did this slide, so that's how we're going to do this. Uh, the midbrain uh, has four colliculi, two superior colliculi that process audio stimuli and two inferior colliculi that process visual stimuli. Um, and they pass those stimuli on up to the brain, uh, to the conscious brain, but they also process some reflexes that uh, have an audio-visual nature to them. So for example, uh, when you hear a loud noise uh, in your left ear, you kind of unconsciously turn your head to the left to try to identify what caused that loud noise. That's called a startle reflex, and that's a, a normal part of being human. Um, there's a thing called the red nucleus. It gets its red color from a high concentration of blood vessels in this part of the brain um, that uh, subconsciously controls limb position and muscle tone. Okay, it takes signals from other parts of the brain, integrates them, and uh, determines uh, how to maintain your limb position uh, and, and how to maintain muscle tone for, for such things as, say, maintaining posture. There's something called the substantia nigra. Um, nigra means black. This area has a lot of mel melanin in it, um, which is a byproduct of secreting dopamine. And the substantia nigra secretes enough dopamine to inhibit basal nuclei twitching. Okay, The basal nuclei set uh, the patterns for most of your muscle movements, most of your coordinated muscle movements. Um, and if you've ever seen someone who has Parkinson's disease and they have that kind of trembling or twitching of their uh, muscles, that's because the substantia nigra is not secreting enough dopamine. And so the basal nuclei uh, are, are running in an uninhibited fashion. Uh, and then finally, the midbrain contains cerebral peduncles. Uh, ped means foot, so peduncle is a little foot in Latin. Uh, and the, the, my understanding is this was named because when they started cutting the brain apart, the, the peduncle cross-section looked a little bit like a footprint. So it was called a, a peduncle. Uh, the cerebral peduncles carry motor commands down from the cerebrum and distribute them out to the rest of the brain stem and, and from there down to the, the spinal cord and uh, wherever else uh, spinal nerves, cranial nerves need to carry out those motor commands. 
The pons, uh, one of its major functions is that it holds the nuclei for cranial nerves 5, 6, 7, and 8. Um, as you can imagine, um, 5 and 7 handle all the muscles of the head. Um, 5 is, is the chewing muscles and 7 is the facial expression muscles. Um, 5 also, as you'll remember, uh, senses all of the, uh, the general senses of the face whereas eight senses your hearing and equilibrium from the ears, so from the inner ears. Um, so very important relay station for those sorts of things. Um, and if you have any kind of uh, reflexes, you know, for example, the, the reflex that if a piece of dust lands on your eye, you would automatically blink your, uh, your eyelids, um, that's a, a 5-7 uh, reflex, so that would take place in the pons. The pons is home to the apneustic and pneumotaxic centers of the respiration control part of your brain. Um, apneustic literally means no breath. Um, that's the part of the, the brain that allows you to hold your breath if you need to do so for some amount of time, if you, you know, dive under the water or something. Uh, pneumotaxic is kind of the opposite. It's, it's a center that senses when your lungs are overstressed with air and forces you to uh, start breathing again. Um, and finally, the word pons is literally uh, the word in Latin for bridge. And the pons contains um, fiber networks that link the cerebrum, the cerebellum, other parts of the brainstem, and the spinal cord, um, all kind of interconnected together through the pons. The medulla oblongata is really the subconscious workhorse of the, the brainstem. Um, starting with, it has cardiovascular centers that adjust the heart rate and blood pressure slash blood flow patterns throughout the body and respiratory rhythmicity centers that set the basic breathing rate. If you do not have a functioning medulla oblongata, you will not breathe. Um, so if there's any part of the brain that you cannot live without, um, it's your medulla oblongata. Uh, and in fact, one of the, um, in fact, the primary way that they determine when a patient has died in emergency rooms and other such places these days is to check for brainstem activity. When the patient is no longer uh, generating electrical signals through their brainstem, um, then, you know, by definition, they, they can't be breathing anymore. They can't be regulating their heart rate. Um, they, they are no longer really alive. Um, there are nuclei for cranial nerves. Um, the, the cranial nerve nuclei, nucleus 8 sort of spills over from the pons into the medulla. And then 9, 10, 11, and 12, um, which you may know have a lot of autonomic activity in them, especially um, cranial nerve 10 here. Um, the vagus nerve handles a lot of your autonomic activity throughout the body. Um, Sensory information decussates, that is, it crosses sides uh, in the medulla on its way to the thalamus. So if you've ever wondered why it is that your right brain handles signals from your left side of your body um, and vice versa, it's because of the way the medulla oblongata is put together. There are structures called the pyramids that uh, decussate the information that cross it from one side to the other. Um, there are some things called solitary nuclei that receive all of the visceral senses from your body. Um, that makes sense with it being near the nucleus for cranial nerve 10, which pulls together all of that visceral information from you know, the status of, of your digestive organs to the status of your heart um, and the amount of oxygen in your blood and things like that. Um, all of that information is pulled together uh, by the solitary nuclei which then kind of redistribute that information to the parts of the brain that need to know about it. And finally, there are some things called olivary nuclei that um, 
there's a slight bulge at the front of the medulla oblongata called the olive, and so the nuclei that live there are called olivary nuclei, and they relay signals to the cerebellum. So primarily they, they handle um, motor signals. If, if some motor activity is going on in the body, it's going to get relayed to the cerebellum so that it can smooth and coordinate that activity. We're going to talk about that in a future slide. Okay, moving on up a little bit, we get to the diencephalon, which also has three parts, and we're going to handle them again sort of top down or, or back to front, as it may be. Um, the, the very roof of the diencephalon is the epithalamus, and its main job nervous system wise is to connect the limbic system um, to connect it to other parts of the brain but also to interconnect within the limbic system um, and recent studies indicate that it has some role in uh, facilitating memory and spatial relationships um, between the hippocampus which handles handles memory and spatial relationships um, connecting it with other parts of the brain the epithalamus is more famous, however, for containing the pineal gland, um, which secretes melatonin uh, on a circadian rhythm. Um, unless you're my children, in which case it seems to fail to do that at bedtime almost every night. But um, the, um, the idea is that it secretes melatonin on a predictable rhythm so that your brain will um, start to go to sleep at roughly the same time every night. Um, the fact that modern life includes a lot of living day-to-day uh, -day not on a predictable schedule um, has made melatonin one of the uh, best-selling dietary supplements of, of the decade um, because people now want to control when their brain goes to sleep uh, instead of relying on the pineal gland to do it for them. Um, the thalamus uh, contains a whole bunch of nuclei. Uh, the anterior nuclei are part of the limbic system and as such uh, connect to the medial nuclei which make uh, our conscious brain aware of our emotional state. Okay, um, so you're your hypothalamus and your limbic system sort of set your emotional state um, and we as, as humans have this tendency to recognize a huge variety of emotions um, I'm nervous I'm uh, gleeful I'm you know we, we have all sorts of emotion words um, but it's said that the brain basically has uh, four emotional states um, mad sad glad um, and, and stressed. Um, uh, well, mad, sad, glad, and uh, scared or stressed. Okay. Um, and so your thalamus, the medial, the anterior nuclei process and the medial nuclei make your, your conscious brain aware of, of which of those emotional states your brain is in. The remaining nuclei, which include um, most of the thalamus, um, filter and pass on sensory information to the cerebrum. And I can't overestimate enough or overemphasize enough this word filter. Um, if your conscious brain were to try to process every single uh, sensory input that, that came across your body in, in the course of, say, a minute, um, it would be overloaded with information. Um, the, the sound of the air conditioning system turning off and on, the uh, feeling of uh, air passing over your uh, the hairs on your arm, and um, the various other you know, senses that happen you know, any slight changes in the pattern of light and dark as, as a shadow passes across the sun or something, um, or a cloud rather, passes across the sun. Um, 
all of these things would, would just drive your, your brain crazy in a sort of literal way. Um, so your brain has a built-in filter in the thalamus that restricts that sensory information so that it uh, the brain only gains access to information that is considered high priority sensory information. Now, if you're a person with ADHD like I am, um, that filter doesn't work as well as it's supposed to, um, and you do become aware uh, every time the air conditioner turns on and off um, and, and things like this. But um, in, in the ideal person, um, such low priority stimuli are filtered out and only the, the high priority stimuli are passed on uh, to the cerebrum. The hypothalamus, um, being a relatively small part of our brain, has a relatively huge number of important uh, centers that, that uh, we cannot live without. Um, the hypothalamus is sort of the brain's body control region, the, the highest level you get to where you're dealing with uh, autonomic and, and such sort of control. So the hypothalamus has autonomic centers that control heart rate, blood pressure, respiration, uh, digestion, and a fairly complicated thing called your stress response. So um, when you're walking across the street and uh, a car suddenly comes careening down the street towards you, you have a stress response. Um, your, your heart rate increases, your breathing rate increases, um, blood is suddenly forced to your muscles so that you can run away from this car. Um, that's an acute stress response. The hypothalamus is also uh, involved in more uh, longer term stress responses, but, but that's sort of the thing we're thinking about here is, is the so-called fight or flight response to stress. Um, there's a pre-optic area that is the part of the hypothalamus that is above the uh, above or in front of the optic nerve. Um, the pre-optic area regulates your body temperature. So if you remember back to A&P uh, introduction at, at the beginning of class where we talked about uh, regulatory cycles, we used body temperature as an example. Um, that um, when your body temperature decreases, um, you want to conserve blood in your body core and you want to make your muscles shiver. Um, when body temperature increases, you want to push blood out to your extremities um, to shed some of that heat and you want to sweat a lot. Okay, so those responses are coordinated by the hypothalamus. Um, the feeding center and the thirst center um, regulate, you know, the, the hunger and thirst drives, okay? Um, those, a drive is essentially a conscious awareness that you really need something. Um, and uh, the hypothalamus in is in charge of figuring out whether you are hungry or thirsty or whether you are satiated, whether you have enough of, of food and, and drink. Um, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, that's above the optic chiasm, um, coordinates your circadian rhythms. So um, that links very directly um, to your epithalamus and its pineal gland. There are somatic centers, just as there are autonomic centers that, that handle your autonomic responses, there are somatic centers that coordinate skeletal muscle responses um, to such things as pleasure. If you've ever, you know, sat in, say, you know, in a nice hot tub or something and you just sort of curl up in pleasure, uh, or if, if you've had a feeling of pain that you, you shrink your body away from, um, those are, to some extent, hypothalamic coordinated responses. Um, and, of course, the human sexual response is a hypothalamic coordinated response. Um, humans like to think that we have control over our uh, 
sexual responses to things, but we really don't. That's an entirely unconscious set of activities um, that uh, is, is directed at the highest level by the hypothalamus, but, but also by other parts of your spinal cord. And finally, there are endocrine centers in the hypothalamus that secrete hormones that provide a neuroendocrine link. Okay, most of what we've dealt with in the nervous system so far is direct nerve stimulation of uh, your body. But the hypothalamus has the ability to control your body using hormones as well. And it has two, it has three major groups of hormones. Um, oxytocin is a hormone that has um, numerous effects integrated sort of with the hype with, with the, the reproductive system um, in females it, it it's it's best known actions are in females it initiates uterine contractions for childbirth and smooth muscle uh, contractions in the mammary glands that uh, let down milk for the baby to to feed uh, but it's also thought to have some roles in men, um, perhaps around ejaculation or something like that. And it is also thought to have some roles in, uh, in couple bonding. Uh, some people have called it the cuddle hormone. Um, but anyway, uh, the other two hormones that the hypothalamus releases, one of them is called antidiuretic hormone, and that's related to this role of the hypothalamus as controlling your thirst center that as as your body becomes thirsty you also need to coordinate um, activities with the kidneys to make sure that they don't let too much water out in your urine so anti-diuretic hormone anti-diuretic it prevents you from making too much urine um, and then finally the endocrine the endocrine centers of the hypothalamus release what are called releasing hormones that go to the uh, pituitary gland, sometimes called the master gland of the endocrine system. And um, the pituitary gland is, is controlled by the hypothalamus and that's the major neuroendocrine link in your body. So those uh, control uh, the hypothalamus therefore controls things like your growth hormone, whether you're, ready to have a growth spurt in childhood. Um, it controls your thyroid hormone. It controls your, uh, which is related somewhat to your body temperature. Um, it controls your stress hormones, um, which are coordinated with this stress response. So there are a lot of places where the hypothalamus has a, a natural tie-in to some endocrine activity in your body. Okay. Um, attached to the brain stem, but somewhat higher in function than the brain stem, is the cerebellum. Uh, at the center of the cerebellum is this little thing called the arbor vitae, which connects all this wonderfully useful gray matter to the cerebellar peduncles, which are at the level of the pons, and, and connect the cerebellum on up. Um, you know, the cerebellum connects on up through the medulla and through the pons and through the midbrain um, to the conscious brain and also on down to uh, and out through you know, down to spinal nerves and cranial nerves to coordinate motor responses in the body. Um, what the cerebellum is most famous for is coordinating and fine-tuning skeletal muscle movements. If a person has blunt trauma to the back of their head that damages their cerebellum, um, the first thing you'll notice is that when they try to stand up, they wobble a lot. They can't coordinate those skeletal muscle movements that they learned, you know, circa two years of age to coordinate so that they could stand upright. Um, well, learning to coordinate move muscle movements like that is basically a process of of creating a place in the gray matter of your cerebellum that stores that particular muscle movement pattern and, and fine-tunes it every time uh, 
you want to use that. Um, it's one of the reasons why there is that saying, it's like riding a bike. Um, once your cerebellum has learned to uh, control all the balancing movements necessary to ride a bicycle, um, you never have to learn that again. It's, it's stored in a, a gray matter loop in the cerebellum. Um, and that brings us to our second thing. It stores complex movement patterns. Um, working together with the basal nuclei, which also help with, with learned movements, um, the cerebellum uh, helps you learn a particular pattern of movement, whether it's riding a bicycle or playing a C chord on a guitar or uh, doing a jump shot in basketball, any of these things that, that requires a coordinated set of movements that, that have the same pattern every time, it's your cerebellum that learns and stores that. Um, some newer information indicates that the cerebellum also keeps track of body position. So what we call your proprioception. Um, you can try this experiment real quickly. You can close your eyes and put your index finger one inch in front of your nose. And then if you open your eyes, you'll find that you probably got that pretty close to exactly one inch in front of your nose. Um, and that's because the cerebellum stores the exact location or the exact uh, status of all of your muscles at any given time um, and can, can calculate the position of any part of your body based on on keeping track of all those muscle movements. Uh, the cerebellum evaluates and compares sensory inputs. So if you have uh, sound coming from both ears, the cerebellum helps in figuring out which sound is louder and therefore which side of your body the, the sound is on, how far away it might be based on, you know, whether the sound is getting louder or getting softer, you know, any of those things. If, if you're trying to uh, compare a present sensory input with a memory of a sensory input. The cerebellum has kind of supercomputer circuitry that can line up those two inputs and compare them. Um, it judges timing. If you've ever tried doing that uh, experiment that they sometimes do in grade school to, to test your reflexes where you, you, you drop a a ruler and you see if you can catch it before it moves a foot or see if you can catch it before it uh, moves two feet or, or something like that. Um, the, the sense of timing that you need to, to space those movements out is provided by the cerebellum. And finally, there are some recent studies that indicate, though this is not, this information has not made it into all the textbooks because it's not conclusively proven yet, um, that the cerebellum may be involved in language. Um, that again, that supercomputer capability that the cerebellum produces can not just smooth and fine tune uh, muscle movement patterns and store those, but it can store bits of language. It can uh, help you acquire language, help you use language. Um, it's involved in planning and scheduling. So there's that timing, uh, there's that timing piece. Well, it can be not just the timing of a muscle movement, but the timing of um, ac various activities in your daily life. You can, if you're good at time management, it means your cerebellum is well connected to the parts of your conscious forebrain that do planning activities. Um, if, like me, you have poor time management, maybe there's, there's a disconnect there. Um, and then finally, there's some inf uh, some evidence that the cerebellum is involved in emotional and impulse control activities that uh, when your conscious forebrain is trying to decide um, which of several courses of action is the right one, um, when an emotional response has gone too far or when to, um, when to check an impulse, um, maybe I shouldn't uh, take my shirt off and dance on the table in the middle of anatomy class, you know, because um, everybody wants to do that, right? That's an impulse. Okay. Um, so maybe we shouldn't do certain things. The cerebellum helps in performing the kind of behind the scenes calculations of, of whether this fits a, a socially acceptable pattern or not. 
Um, and so perhaps um, people who have some problems with emotional control or impulse control or people perhaps with autism who have trouble recognizing socially appropriate patterns, um, maybe there's a disconnect there between the cerebellum and your conscious forebrain, um, just as with those of us with, with ADD and our, our planning scheduling problems. Um, finally, I want to introduce one set of lower brain centers that are all connected together, um, called a functional brain center. It's, it's not one part of the brain, it's several parts of the brain that act together, and it's called the reticular formation. Um, descending tracks from the reticular formation maintain muscle tone, um, maintain respiration, adjust your heart rate and blood pressure. You'll remember we've mentioned several of these things already as jobs of various parts of the um, the brainstem. We're just rearranging and the uh, hypothalamus, we're just noting how they all work together. That the hypothalamus can't control uh, heart rate and respiration without being connected to uh, the, uh, the medulla oblongata. Similarly, um, there is an ascending set of tracts here um, that form something called the reticular activating system. And it has this the main function of, of rousing you from sleep and maintaining your alertness during the day. And so you can see that this little orange set of brain structures that's highlighted here um, connects uh, through all of these purple pathways into the conscious parts of your brain um, and, and stimulates those. So I want to focus on this particular activating system for a moment. It has it consists of more than 20 different gray matter centers that have been identified as as functioning together to do reticular activating activities. Um, they're located in the anterior pons, the posterior midbrain, the thalamus, and the posterior hypothalamus. Um, but their axons project as far out as into the cerebral cortex itself, which we'll learn about in the next video. They release a complex mixture of neurotransmitters. Most parts of the brain have a preferred neurotransmitter that they work with. The reticular activating system, there's acetylcholine coming out of the thalamus, but there is dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, histamine, which is a major uh, sleep and wake hormone, and glutamate, uh, most recently identified, um, that come from centers in the hypothalamus and the brainstem. So that's six different neurotransmitters working together in this complex mixture. And they coordinate a number of related functions. The most obvious is that they generate consciousness, wakefulness, and what we call arousal. That's not sexual arousal, that's arousal in the sense that you're body is aroused from sleep and is um, able to carry out normal daily activities. Um, if, if you've ever had this problem where you kind of get up in the morning and uh, your, your body is not fully ready to do all of its normal daily activities, maybe your, uh, your reticular activating system is not coming online as quickly as you'd like it to. Um, some of us need a good cup of coffee before our RAS is, is in full swing. Um, but all joking aside, major lesions here can lead to a complete failure to wake up at all, um, a state called coma. Uh, and so again, um, if you had one part of the body that you didn't want to lose, um, this section of the uh, pons and midbrain that generate the wakefulness signal that keeps your brain, or that, that makes your brain aroused and awake in the first place, um, would not be one you'd want to lose. Um, 
the RAS mediates transitions from sleep to wake. Okay, so as as you wake up in the morning, if you wake up naturally as opposed to waking up through an alarm clock or something, um, there's a slow buildup of, of RAS activity, and the more RAS activity you have, the more awake you are. Um, finally, the RAS generates states of high attention and alertness. They've noticed that the more blood flow to centers in the uh, uh, the midbrain, for example, um, the more your brain generates a high state of attention. Um, and yes, this has also been linked to attention deficit disorder. Um, they think some of us who have ADD uh, suffer from a, a lack of uh, activity in one of these RAS centers that would normally focus our attention. Um, and so a lot of the ADD medications are, are stimulants that seek to uh, stimulate that RAS activity or, or replace its activity by stimulating the parts of the forebrain that the RAS would normally stimulate to generate high attention. Okay, so that wraps up my lecture on um, the lower brain. We'll come back in the next lecture and talk about uh, all of the functional areas of the higher brain, the, uh, the conscious and emotional brain, um, basically the cerebrum. All right, good luck, happy studying, and I hope you learned something.